Hello, everybody, and I hope everyone's doing well. Before I talk about a document that I created, I want to talk about some existing documents and ideas that are floating out there. But before I get into all of that, let's talk briefly about CrowdStrike. So CrowdStrike happened a couple of weeks ago, and Basically what happened is a update was posted by CrowdStrike and this update caused approximately 8.5 million computers to go offline and these were business computers. In short, CrowdStrike is a piece of software that is similar to internet security antivirus software but for businesses. So it's not pre-installed on computers you buy at retail stores. It's not pre-installed on most computers you buy. You have to purchase a copy of CrowdStrike and install it on your computer. So when many of these Fortune 500 companies installed CrowdStrike on their computers, what they got in exchange was security, vulnerability management, analysis and mitigation. So basically if CrowdStrike detected malware or other types of security issues on a Windows computer, then it would take action against that malicious action. And this document here explains all of that in tremendous detail. But what I want to do is go through certain parts of this document because it leads up to something I will talk about later. So they did do a root cause analysis of what happened to create this issue with CrowdStrike. And there are other social media channels and other videos you can watch that will go into exceptional technical detail. I've watched some of those. But even before watching those, I already knew what happened because I used to write software like this a long time ago. And it's a software that's written in a way that I wouldn't recommend and it's not something that I would do uh, in present times. but. Um, Certain techniques were used here, and those techniques resulted in a systemic crash. So that's what happened with uh, CrowdStrike. And so this is a, re a report from CrowdStrike explaining their side of the story. The short of it is, is that they used a software tool called Regular Expressions. Regular Expressions is not exactly code, but it's a type of parameter identification process you can implant in code so that the software can use a regular expression API and you pass in a parameter, you pass in a pattern string, and it can go through data, whether it be a file, whether it be a string of text that's coming in, and it can even be binary, binary information. And it can tell you if the pattern matches. So most malware analyses is on the uh, basis of pattern evaluation. And regular expression seems like a good tool for this, although it is not a tool I've traditionally recommended. And I've rarely used regular expression for the very reason we see in this CrowdStrike situation. And that is because regular expressions are more like SQL. They are more like XQuery and XSLT in that you can't actually debug them and you can't actually inspect them with granularity in the same way that you can normal computer code. So anyway, um, the best way to read this document, by the way, is not to read it from the beginning, or you could read page one, but you really need to drop from the first one or two pages down to this page. 
So this page should have been put first because it gives you the definition of terms. And so when you look at the, their description of what went wrong, they say the number of fields in a IPC template type was not validated. And they say at compile time, it doesn't matter if it's compile time or runtime, validation is the practice that you apply to make sure that data is correct. And I've already watched two hours of, of explanations on this, so I'm not going to repeat all of that. They, they're out there on um, social media. So anyway, um, but this channel file, 291, is nothing um, special. It's just the name of a file that has a certain structure to it, and that structure is used by the software, in this case the CrowdStrike software, to identify a certain type of malware or security issues. This is the main thing that caused the crash. Runtime array bounds check was missing. You really don't have to read this entire document. This is the root cause. Or this is the root issue, should we say. It's not necessarily the root cause. It's the root issue. Okay, It's the operational issue that took place. Basically, when you have a list of data, you have a list of data sequenced from 1 to 2 to 3 to 4, and in this case, up to 21. The software has to correctly access data at a specific sequence. So if I have, if I have a sequence of 20 values, 20 separate values, then I can only access at, at most 20, the 20th value, okay? I can only access at most the 20th value. If I have a 21st value somewhere, but the software doesn't know about it, then you will have, a, you will have an error. The error can result in a crash. It depends on the conditions in the program, right? So the program was updated to only consider up to 20 inputs. But the, the people who designed an update to CrowdStrike had set up a condition where a 21st input was provided to the software. It, so in the form of data, there was a 21st data element that was provided but the program was still bound to up to 20 inputs. So you have to follow the rules in the program, not in the data. So because the program violated the rules that were encoded in the program, thereby there being a maximum of 20 inputs for this particular uh, channel file, channel file 291, then a crash occurred. Programs actually crash all the time, especially during development. You don't want them to crash when they're out in production, but there are crashes that, there are errors that happen within programs that are caught by the program and it's either mitigated or the program is terminated. The problem here is that because this CrowdStrike program was embedded into the heart of Windows, rather than running as a regular user program, then because it was embedded in the heart of Windows, when this crash occurred, it brought down Windows itself. This CrowdStrike program could be written as a regular application that's not bound to the core of Windows. And if it crashed, it wouldn't have caused any issue like this. Okay. So that's basically what occurred. And the and I will go out on a limb here. Some people would disagree with what I'm going to say. 
But I would say that the vast majority of malware exploits and vulnerabilities, it's this right here. And the reason why this happens is you could say it's sloppy coding on the part of a programmer. You could say that shortcuts get taken sometimes. And you can even say that an assumption is made that the data is correct and known to the program. So there is no reason to check for the length of that data. Okay the check for the length of that data. And I would do a code demonstration here, but that's not my, that's not uh, what I intended to do in this discussion. But basically getting your data, putting it into a sequence, and then checking the length of that sequence is common to all imperative programming languages. It doesn't matter if you're talking about C, C Sharp, C++, Java, Go, Rust, Swift, every last one of those programming languages, including Python, provides you the ability to check for the size of the data before you access the data. And good programming involves what you would call that in a, a very a very paranoid way, uh, stringently checking the data. Sometimes you might want to skip that because skipping that can gain you some performance. But the performance gain can be minuscule in today's version of software programming and the infrastructure that program relies on. If you go back 20... 30 or 40 years ago, yes, there was a case to be made that continuously checking the length of data, even every uh, second or every millisecond, would cause the program to slow down. And so people might take the shortcut of not checking the data if they believed and felt confident that the data was in a certain length and range that they could rely on. But Highly defensive programming, just like defensive driving, means that you take nothing for granted and you always put defenses around every piece of code because every piece of code's assumptions can be violated at any moment. So that's basically what CrowdStrike was all about, was just a, a, a one line of code, really. You know, and when I say one line of code, I mean an if statement. If length of array is less than or equal to 21, then whatever. Otherwise, just don't even bother, right? So that's all you have to do. And you can do that particular pseudocode in any programming language. So here's the other issue is that the testing of this it, to summarize all of this is basically when they were testing this code, every, everything tested out fine within the confines of CrowdStrike Corporation. The problem was they tested the code against a fake version of the file. So the malware data or analysis data was provided to the CrowdStrike engine. And so it was like, hey, you know, um, we don't need to make a, a copy of production. We don't need to make a copy of production on our developer machines because we are certain about the code and we are certain about the data conditions. And that's where the bottom fell out because production data oftentimes differ from development data if you rely on development data. It's very easy to make development data work for the benefit of the software developer, right? That's where you can end up with some blinders. And so it's actually more difficult in terms of time, in terms of setup, to maintain 
a legitimate copy of production in development, which is why many developers will forego that um, particular approach. And in 90% of the cases, that can actually work out. But there are cases where it does not. So it's a better practice that as the software matures, that you shift away from what we call mock data, test, uh, test data that is just uh, fabricated data that looks like what it should like, look like in production, but isn't generated in a production situation. And so that is the primary testing failure that occurred with CrowdStrike. So that's pretty much what all this document says. So, and then, you know, they talked about how they're going to have third party uh, re review the, um, the code and they made reference to Microsoft and how it would be uh, best if Microsoft had a way for, um, had a way for um, security providers like them to write their code in, in, in what's called user space rather than kernel space. And I learned from, uh, I think his name is Dave Cutler. The, the channel is called Dave's Garage. That Microsoft actually tried to do that. They called it Patch Guard. But they were shut down by the federal government because some of the antivirus providers did not want, um, did not want that. They lobbied the federal government to shut down Microsoft's um, program of trying to make a safer way of checking security that would be available to all uh, antivirus providers. So there's politics involved in that amongst antivirus providers. And so that's why that got shut down for political reasons. And as a result of that, that's why we, that's one of the reasons why we are where we are today because Microsoft actually had a good design called Patch Guard. And it would be very useful that in the wake of this uh, situation that Microsoft be given another chance to uh, reintroduce the Patch Guard approach rather than what Microsoft has been talking about here recently, which is virtual machines. And I like virtual machines. I use them. But the problem with virtual machines is that um, in a production scenario, in the way that Microsoft is talking about, and they're not talking about actual virtual machines, but a virtualized process, is that it reduces performance. And so one of the criticisms of Patch Guard is the thought that it might reduce performance, but that's not true. It would definitely be uh, more performant than a virtualized process in kernel space. So anyway, um, that's basically what happened. And the reason I brought this up is because CrowdStrike is still on people's minds. The 8.5 million computers that were crashed. Because I've been thinking about this because um, I still uh, look at and evaluate uh, programming languages. And I constantly reevaluate technology. So there has been quite a bit of talk among U.S. federal agencies about memory safety, right? Because that's what the CrowdStrike um, code error is considered, a form of memory safety violation. So the discussion is that if it was impossible to do if it was impossible to have memory uh, access violations or to access memory in an improper way within a computer program, then you could reduce the majority of vulnerabilities. There's other research out there to show that that's actually not true and that even managed languages can have problems with security vulnerabilities above and beyond memory safety issues. It's just that memory safety issues is the most common and the most uh, 
easy to, to address. But yet again, here's the thing. The particular memory access vulnerability that you see with that you see with CrowdStrike and with many programs out there, it actually can be reproduced in uh, nearly all programming languages, including the one that's being lauded right now, which is Rust. Right, so Rust does put more uh, structure and makes a, a program more strict. But the problem with that is you will basically end up with a situation that is as worse, if not similar to, the situation you have now because you can make the same error in Rust. So translating all the C code to Rust using a initiative called Tractor, because I've used code converters before, they never are 100%. And because of that, they oftentimes cause far more work and far more bugs than uh, what you what you hope for you know it's you get that hope where it's like wow this would save me a lot of time and then it's like when you use these converters and today we do have large language models we have AI we have generative AI that can help this process but anyone who's used generative AI for more than a few months and I've used it for over a year with software development will know that generative AI um, cannot produce expert level, senior developer level software that is production grade and superior quality. It can get 80% there, but so can the code converters of the past without AI. And so you're, you're, no, more, you're, you're no more close to the goal that you have of trying to create a clean version of code you think is um, out to pasture, but it's not. Because this code that they're, this language they're talking about, C and to a lesser extent C++, um, Windows itself is written in C. Microsoft Windows itself is written in C. And you're not going to use a tool like this to rewrite Windows. Microsoft would not allow it. It would jeopardize what they got going on. And it would take an enormous amount of years. And um, I mean, Microsoft is not a stranger to spending like $20 billion on um, a new initiative like their investment in OpenAI. But they're not about to spend um, half a trillion dollars trying to convert Microsoft Windows. And reverse the clock on what they're, how far they've progressed with Windows, even though I, I, I personally view Linux to be superior. But even with that, what they have now is better than what they'll have if they try to convert it all uh, to Rust. And Microsoft is investing in Rust for the kernel code, but um, they can't, they cannot and I know people say never say never, but they cannot convert Windows overall from C to Rust, primarily because there is an enormous amount of software, more than you can see, and most of the software you see on uh, store shelves is just the very tip of the iceberg of all that software that's been made for Microsoft Windows since 1980. So you got approximately uh, 46, 48 years of software out there that binds to the C protocol in Windows. So it is nonsense to suggest it. So anyway, so that's a non-starter from what I can see. But again, the very issue you're trying to address 
doesn't get addressed by rust. It only appears that way. But if you don't use the proper coating mechanisms, which rust cannot enforce that, it can't enforce that in every single instance where a programmer just decides to just, they, they have a vector, they have some type of array, and they're just going to index it directly. They're just going to index it directly. The programming languages allow for that. Just look at a forward loop. For, for example, for i equals zero, i is less, uh, i is less than seven, i plus plus, and then within the body of the for loop, you know, you are taking that array and you're indexing it with i. Okay, that for loop offers, the for loop preamble actually offers some kind of code safety there. But there are cases where with, even within the for loop, you might do some arithmetic on that variable i, and you might just, you know, overrun that um, overrun that link the bounds the upper bounds of that array just like that, even in Rust. So you're back to square one. So here are all the languages that uh, the different agencies they work together and you know they wrote a document making a case for memory safe, and it's not about that. You know, you know, I was kind of with them many, many years ago, but I had to really think about this from a more practical standpoint. And where I, where I start with is that our best operating systems and our best, our best platforms are not written in these languages. They just are not. They're not written in these languages. And they're missing a few languages on here besides that, right? They're missing a few languages. But um, there, there are many applications written in C, Go, Java, Python, Rust. There are some being written in Rust. And there are many written in, in Swift. But they are, they, you do not build the majority of the infrastructure that runs a multi-trillion dollar um, digital ecosystem on these languages. So Linux, Unix, Microsoft Windows, and many others, they're not defined in these languages. And because they're not defined in these, defined in these languages, and yes, it's really a, a big question mark to what extent the Linux kernel will be um, addressed in Rust. I think they're just playing around with this right now because the, the multiple millions of code in the Linux kernel, 90% of it is in Rust. I'm sorry, 90% of it is in C. 90% of it is in C. And so, because the Linux kernel is in C, the Windows kernel is in C, the Unix kernel is in C, and Unix is what Mac OS from Apple is based off of, then that means you're going to have a, a situation where the software programs that work the best on those operating systems will also be written in C. And then these program languages here, they make it easier for programmers to write programs, but those program, these programming languages themselves, underneath, they translate from these programming languages to the protocol that C defines, that is defined in C, so that the programming code that is generated by these programming languages, the native executable code that is ultimately generated, can talk to the operating system which actually runs the code. And so it is illogical 
to consider that um, any of these are going to uh, really supplant um, supplant the predominant system programming language C. So that was my CrowdStrike talk, and you know, moving on, I just want to say that um, th this sounds good, but in reality it's going to lead to a tremendous amount of disappointment. And I don't uh, discourage anyone from trying. Yes, try. You never know what comes out of that. That's absolutely fantastic. But what I see is a course where you deal with what you have now and you build on it and you improve it because it's already given you tremendous gains and dividends in other areas. And you just really need to um, have a software development focus when you're writing these things where it is your personal standard as a software developer. It's not even about the organization. As a software developer, you want to write code that is not quickly uh, pushed out. You want to write code that is striving for an elite level, a high caliber of quality every single line. So anyway, on that basis, I'm actually here to talk about writing native uh, desktop applications in Linux. And one of the ways you can do that is with a toolkit called GTK. Now GTK is written in C and I spent many years writing a couple of desktop applications or a, ver a version of a, a particular desktop application on Linux using the C API GTK3. But there, once upon a time, I also used GTK MM. I wanted to see what that was like. I was way back when, I think it was 10 years ago, I was just exploring some stuff. These are things that I do in private, you know, things that I explore and that I work on and understand. And anyway, so GTK MM is the C++ wrapper. It's a C++ interface to GTK MM. And you may ask yourself, why would you want a C++ wrapper to GTK? Well, GTK is um, predominant in the Linux world and in the Linux environment for writing native, close to the metal desktop applications. These are applications that have the potential to perform better, to have uh, the most acute access to everything that Linux can provide on behalf of the end user. And so, it's a very attractive toolkit and it competes very well with toolkits like KDE. But the thing about GTK being in C is that there are many uh, best practices with data structures and algorithms and with um, pre-packaged li libraries, as it were that you might use to streamline the software development process that um, do not exist in as accessible a form in C as you might see in languages like Java or C Sharp. So what are you to do? Well, you could use the, the bindings for GTK that are in Java, Python, and increasingly Rust you could do that. The problem I observe with that is the coverage of the GTK features and the ability to tap into the root level GTK API is not as straightforward or as uh, convenient to do in those, those languages and those wrappers. So C++ is ideal in that case, and that is why I used C++ in conjunction with the GTK3 API that is in C because C++ can seamlessly weave in C 
C, C libraries and C code and C programming idioms, syntax, and approaches, right? So that allowed me to productively use a C-based API, but in a language and tool chain and environment that allowed you to build desktop applications in Linux in a much more streamlined way with better libraries in terms of um, lists, list data types that are called containers, right? Iterators, you have more convenient strings in C++ than you do in C. And you have the option of managing memory in a much more um, uh, wide, wide ranging way in C++. Yes, I know the hardcore C developers out there would say, oh no, you can do the same thing. You can, but the actual representation of that for the broad uh, majority of developers uh, is um, uh, leaves much to be desired. So you have smart pointers that I don't really use in C++, but I have used them. But you have smart pointers in C++ so that you can um, handle memory safety issues um, more effectively. And my favorite technique in C++ is just to use the stack uh, for the most part. And by using the stack in a very uh, clever way, and I do use that C word, clever, I know, but if you use the stack in a certain way, then you really don't need pointers and you can avoid memory management issues altogether doing it that way. And if you check the length of your, your arrays, your containers, or you use iterators uh, in the appropriate way, then you don't run into those memory corruption bugs. You don't run into those memory issues. And so... Yes, I'm, I am influenced. I'm in, I am influenced from my long history writing C sharp, right? I wrote code in C sharp for a long time, and I still do. And so I bring that sensibility of code that is very clean and very, um, let's say, very convenient in terms of. Um, uh, programming idioms to check and validate your inputs, right? I don't go the the stereotypical C hacker route in bit twiddling that can cause issues such as what we see with CrowdStrike. So anyway, I have been looking at GTK MM recently because the group of uh, people, the organization, that produced GTK released a new version of GTK a couple of years ago. GTK 4 has a number of changes to it that don't uh, entirely embrace what you did in GTK 3. So your code could break just trying to rebuild it for GTK 4 if you wrote it in GTK 3. So I put a I put a pause on developing any new code going from GTK3 to GTK4 until I was sure how I wanted to go about that and if I even had the motivation to go about that. And on that latter point, I really didn't have the motivation in the past year um, due to a wide variety of reasons. But I'm trying to get to a point now where I can move back into this so that I can uh, do code the way I want to. But the problem with GTK MM is that the manual for it is a website. And um, the thing is, I actually don't spend my time, I don't spend a lot of time online. Um, I like to put my internet connection on airplane mode most of the time. That is the number one way to preserve your, your laptop's battery. I use a laptop. Yes, I prefer desktops, but um, desktops are the supreme computers that you can have. And that's my view. Desktops are the supreme computer. But if you're going to use a laptop, you want to maximize battery life. And 
even though we have laptops out now where you can get like 20 hours of battery life or whatever, nothing reduces battery life more than wireless, right, or radio, Bluetooth, all of that. Yes, video can do that, but if you're not doing video, then your next target for uh, battery, uh, a faster battery, battery dissipation is going to be the radio, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, etc. So I leave my connections off. I don't have them on when I don't need them. And a lot of work that I do, I do it without an internet connection. And so, so having documentation in a website where I have to keep my internet connection active for an hour or hours at a time is not something I prefer. So what I did is I took this website and I downloaded it. You know, you can use a tool in Linux called wget. Uh, this is the, I posted this, um, I posted this recently and I've done this before, right? Way back when in 2013, I did this for GTK three. And if you would Google search for a GTK three manual, um, oftentimes my webpage would come up. But I decided not to do a GTK four manual. You know, if someone asked for it, maybe I would consider it. But um, the thing is, I decided to focus on GTK MM, which is the C++ um, wrapper for GTK four, because I want to um, I want I want the APIs to be more uh, consistent, so I don't want to um, do that seamless switch between C and C++. Um, I don't mind it, but I think that my code will be cleaner using GTK MM, and so that's why I set about on June 9th creating a 921 page PDF version of that website. I didn't write out. 921 pages. I downloaded the, the web pages and then I used a tool called Pandoc to convert it to ODT format. And then once I had an ODT format, which is the native file format for LibreOffice, which is the alternative to Microsoft Office, and you can run LibreOffice on Microsoft Windows. But I'm running this on Linux. And so what it does, it allows me to edit the the overall document. So I went through 921 pages and I cleared out all the unnecessary graphics. I put pages in the correct order because when you have a website like that, when you have when you have documentation in a web format like this, you know, it looks fine here, but when you actually download each page, they don't link to each other in the same order you have right here, right? This this is just web page um, web page design. That's all this is. And, you know, this is HTML markup underneath that defines one, two, three, four, five, so on and so on. But when you download it, that relationship does not exist like that when you run it through a tool like uh, Pandoc, because all Pandoc sees is a, a bunch of HTML pages, right? And the HTML pages may not be named in the same way as what you see on the web page. And so anyway, the order can get way out of sort. So anyway, I did use uh, what's called a file list to uh, feed into Pandoc. The file list allows you to define the ordering of the pages. And I did the best I could with that file list and I came very close to everything being in order, but I still had to make some changes. It took several hours and I removed duplicate pages because again, a web link might link to um, multiple, may link to the same source page. You might have multiple links linking to the same main page, but the links have different labels to them, different, you know, different names, but it's, they're all linking to the same thing. So you end up with duplicate pages. So I cleaned all those out. I cleaned out unnecessary graphics. You know, what I did is um, I got rid of stuff like, you know, this, you know, this was on every page. You know, you had something like that. Or, you know, if I go in here, 
right? I have this, I have this, and I have this. And I just don't need all of that, right? You don't, you don't need those graphics, right? Because it's a PDF file. And the PDF file, right, um, basically you just want to just scroll right through it, right, and just read it. And see, a file like this you can put on your phone, a tablet. You can read it straight up here on a, a laptop or desktop. And, you know, you can increase the page. Um, you can um, even print print this uh, th this document you know if you needed a paper copy and you know that sort of thing just isn't um, easy to do with something like this right it's just you, you can't print this in the same way so PDF is more convenient and some open source projects make it a um, not just a habit but they have it automated where any changes to their API, it produces a new PDF. And I love those, those open source projects. I love that stuff. But the GTK team and the GTK MM team, understandably, uh, doesn't uh, do that. So anyway, this is out here for the, anyone that wants that, right? And um, that's uh, pretty much what I wanted to disclose today. And if you have any questions, just let me know. Thank you.